How's everybody tonight? Good? Okay, quiz time. A couple of quick questions. We've, uh, we've been talking about uh, the top of the mountain, which is the, the most challenging uh, trait spiritually, and uh, it, is, it is the uh, love. Do you remember the Greek word that we use for that word love at the top of the mountain? Anybody remember? Yeah, it's, it's actually a very close cousin. It's a ga-pen, A-G-A-P-E-N, used 33 times, but same concept as agape. Agapen, it's a, form, it's a form of the word agape, used 33 times. And so what we've done the last couple of weeks is we've looked at um, seven signs of love in your life. This is the highest form of love. There's a reason I believe it's at the very top. You know, we start out with faith, and then we move up to virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection. Uh, affection and and that particular love was called Philadelphian and it was a, a good example is the love between Jonathan and David where their souls were knit together so this is the highest form of love now I believe that as we go up the mountain and we get up to the pinnacle of love uh, there's times where we still may struggle with some of those characteristics or traits you know we may not have mastered them all but the idea is that we go up there and add to those and then the most mature Christian can demonstrate unconditional love, agapin, agapin love. I'm sorry, agapin. So let's go um, through our list very quickly, and then we're going to get to the last four, actually the last three tonight, and we'll talk about that. And then next Wednesday night, what I want to do is kind of a summary where we review these very quickly and just take questions and answers, and we'll talk about applying these in our lives and some of the challenges that we face in these Christian attributes. So last week, um, as we identified the seven signs of love in your life, the first one we mentioned is uh, how do you know that you have this? Uh, How do you know that you practice it? Uh, Number one, we said that it requires sacrifice. If If you're around a person where it's always all about them, and their interest and their needs, and they don't ever stop to even ask people how they're doing or what they can do for somebody else. They're not practicing this form of love, agape, because agape requires sacrifice. We see Jesus, who sacrificed himself. Uh, John 15, verses 12 through 13, is, is Jesus' sacrifice, and then we're incur- encouraged. Uh, In John 15, this is my commandment, that you love one another. How? As I have loved you. We know Jesus showed the ultimate sacrificial love when he gave himself on the cross. The perfect Lamb of God, without sin, who gave his life for my sin. Sean, yes, sir. Agape is just a different verb form. It's the same word, basically, agape, agape. Same, same idea, it's just used a little bit. I've never had a Greek class, and I wish I had when I was in college, but, um, but they'll probably tell you it's just a different form of, of the word agape as it's used in the, in the Greek, you know, it's a, like a verb tense, agape. Same, think of it as the same word, basically. Yeah, I, I would say that's probably a fair statement. So without a, without a command of the Greek language, And uh, a a study of that agape word and agape, I really can't tell you the difference other than just consider them to be the same thing. So if anybody else could add to that between now and next Wednesday, that'd be great. And maybe I can do a little research between the two to see what the difference is, Sean. Good question. So require sacrifice. We looked at 1 John 3, 16, where it talks about um, a love for the brothers and then uh, we went to number two, the second sign, is it, it's, a, it's a humility, um, a cooperative spirit toward people. So you, this kind of love gives people the benefit of the doubt. It gives them a little space, a little grace, a little 
um, spirit of, of, of loving a person. And, uh, and I mentioned that when you walk into a congregation and you sense that they're infighting, you know, there's jealousy and bitterness and anger, and, and they say nasty things about each other, this is not a loving congregation. There's that humility just doesn't exist. And we looked at Philippians 2, 2 through 5, Colossians 3, starting in verse 12, put on love. And then 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, we're told to be diligent or earnestly work at loving one another. So this is the kind of love that is a cooperative love you see in loving congregations. People work hard to get along. Now, it doesn't mean that we tolerate sin. We know that the church at Corinth was rebuked in 1 Corinthians 5 because they tolerated a brother who was actively engaged in sin yet considered himself a member of the congregation. So Paul rebuked the church for that. So uh, number three, uh, our next uh, list of, uh, of seeing seven signs of love in your life is uh, it is a, a love that is mixed with grace and abundant forgiveness. And I mentioned this is a love that's shown to the undeserving. I think of Jesus when the woman caught in adultery was brought before him. You remember the scene where he was kneeled down and, you know, writing in the sand. And, and according to the law of Moses, she should have been stoned for committing adultery. Never mind the man who should have been stoned as well. That wasn't the point. The religious leaders were trying to trick Jesus, you may recall. They didn't care about the guy. They just brought the woman. He knew that the law of Moses said stoner. But what did Jesus say to the crowd as she was presented to him? There you go, Sean. Let, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. So Jesus never said that she wasn't guilty. The truth is she was. She was caught in adultery, thrown down before him. She was probably weeping and ashamed, had her head bowed. And so Jesus addressed them. I want you to think about your life. Tell me that you don't have any sin in your life, and if that's true, feel free. Go ahead and stone her to death. Throw the stone at her if your sin is, is not absent in your life. And so I think Maybe the older men thought about that, reflected on what Jesus said, and they dropped the stone. All the way down to the youngest, who eventually dropped their stones as well, they felt convicted. But it's a, it's a love that shows grace and mercy and abundant forgiveness. Romans 5, 8, Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, and um, those are examples of of uh, the kind of love we need to have where we are showing our love to even the undeserving. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Loving the people who have messed up. And that's even true in the church today. If you think about it, there's a lot of congregations out there that have outreach ministries that deal with people who've been trapped in sin, maybe have addiction problems, just come out of prison, maybe have alcohol issues, drug use issues. But they love these people. They show them unconditional love. They work with them and try to help them reestablish their life. And I appreciate that mercy and that grace shown to them, um, an abundant love shown to the undeserving. You know, we've, we tend to forget that God loves all people equally. He loves every soul out there, and they deserve a chance. They deserve grace and mercy, um, and if they're not making an attempt to be loving or, or um, change their life, then they'll stand before God and they'll give an account. Okay, our next one, number four, and we talked about this last week, was um, that this essential core value has to be found in our life, this unconditional love, agape love. And so Paul turns to 1 Corinthians 13. We often call it the love chapter. Now, in context, does anybody remember what was happening in, in the church when he wrote 1 Corinthians 13? And why would he slide this in, the love chapter, in that context? Who can tell me? Y'all remember what's going on?
Let's say that again. Oh, you lo- okay. I'm glad I'm, I'm not the only one that does that. I say that's when your train of thought derails. Yes, sir. Who said that? Yeah, it was gifts. Go ahead. Okay, there, there were a lot of problems in 1 Corinthians 13. If you, if you go through, I've identified, I've done that before from the, the very first chapter through the end of 1 Corinthians. There's probably, it's up in the teens, you know, the number of problems Paul's having to address. They had questions about divorce and remarriage. They were tolerating sin. In this particular case, if you go back one chapter, Paul talks quite a bit about the human body, right? The eye, the ear the hand and the foot, and what he's saying is, guys, if you have a particular gift that that God has allowed you through the Holy Spirit to perform, don't go thinking that you're somehow superior because you have a particular gift. If you have a gift and and you can do wonderful things with this God-given gift manifested through the Holy Spirit, that's wonderful, except if your gift is used in the absence of love, it's worth nothing. That makes sense? So that's why Paul puts 1 Corinthians 13 where he does. And he says, look, gifts are important and they're part of God's plan, but they're nothing without love. And so that's why he starts off 1 Corinthians 13 using examples like, you know, if I can do this, but I don't have love. If I can do this, I don't have love. It's nothing. You can speak in t- tongues of men and of angels, but don't have love. Okay, Glenn? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Let's actually go back to that if you want to. I think that's, I was reading that earlier tonight. Um, let me get out of that app and open this up. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 because I really like Paul's message. Paul. Um, well, let's just start at verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 12, where he's saying, the body does not consist of one member, but many. So he's using this metaphor of the human body. Think of your congregation, he says to the church, as a human body. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make not make it any less a part of the body. And then I like verse 17, which I've always been kind of amused at. Could you imagine a giant eye walking down the street? Just an eye? Well, first of all, it couldn't even walk. There's no feet. So I don't know how the eye would be there, but he said, what if, what if, um, what if the whole body was an eye? Then you wouldn't hear. If the whole body was an ear, he said, then it couldn't smell. God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. And so he said they're all important. And then I think what you were mentioning, uh, Glenn, on the contrary, the parts of the body, verses 22, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those, those, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. Our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. So basically, God gives different value to different parts of the body. The, the ones that we tend not to value, which is interesting, God tends to place more value on the ones that we as humans don't value. So think about that in terms of the church. 
I see maybe a sweet member of the congregation who's very loving and giving, but they're not really that much in the public's eye. They're very low-key, but they just keep doing their job, very humbly giving, serving, and loving. Do a lot of things quietly from week to week, uh, just loving on people. Well, see, they may not be noticed like somebody that takes a very visual role and gets up in front and let's say that somebody's super talented at making announcements. You know, you just feel good after they make announcements. Wow, they're so talented. They do that great. Well, we may remember that person more that's in a public role, but the truth is God may value more and bless more the person who's working quietly behind the scenes that doesn't really get attention, right? And that's the way God works. God says it's, it's those ones that don't get the recognition, the ones that are quietly serving and loving each week that I put more honor on. In God's eyes, they're very honorable. So that's why he says, uh, if you go back to 13, so what if I speak in tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love? I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What if I have prophetic powers and I know all mysteries and have all knowledge? What if I have all faith? I can move mountains. But if I don't have love, he says, you're nothing. And so then he goes uh, in verses 4 through 7. He describes what love looks like, and I appreciate that. In verses 8 through 10, he mentions that this uh, love will outlast all gifts, the gifts that are found in the early church. He talks about a cessation of those gifts. And then he goes on to say that in verse 11, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away. I believe that's a reference to the written word of God, the complete and mature church as the, as the Bible's written. So these things are going to go away, the temporary nature of miraculous gifts, but love, he says, always remains. If you want to go for something that's really important in your, in your tr Christian walk, practice love. Practice the kind of love that you read about in 1 Corinthians 13. Faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these, he says, is love. Yes, ma'am. You did, you did raise your hand, right? Yes, Juju. Yeah. Yeah, don't say that to Meg because she'll probably correct you on some of those. Very interesting. Yes, right. Right. Yes. Yes. The voice of a God and not a man. Yeah. Yeah. So if you wear shiny costumes and enjoy the praise of men, watch out. Worms are coming, right? Yeah. He was in love with himself, wasn't he? Right, yeah. The, it says that um, pride cometh before the fall. Well, I tell you what, God loves 
humble servants who are loving. And uh, all of us, I think all of us struggle in some way or another of loving self, wanting to put self on a pedestal or do things where we deserve recognition or pride can creep in. We just have to, we have to be careful. And um, I just, to me, sacrificial love is one of the greatest attributes that we could strive for to, to continually serve others, to not expect anything in return. And, and when we're praised, hopefully give God, God the praise and just say, I'm, I'm just God's servant and I'm loving other people because Jesus loves on me. You know, I want to love people the same way. That's a wonderful attitude. God so values that. And I, and I believe that when we celebrate on that great banquet day with the Lord, I think, I think there's going to be a special table set for those super humble, loving servants. I just have to believe that because that's, that's whom God really, really loves and appreciates. So, yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, after after that memorial feast where he initiated the, the, the blood and the bread, you know, this new covenant, he said, um, I, I'm thinking in his mind, he's probably having these these thoughts like I'm not in a really good place emotionally right now. I know what's going to happen. You know, I, I know that all the prophecies say that I'll be crucified. I, I just need some quiet time. I need to get away. I just need, I just need some space, you know. But what did he do? He girded up his loins, knelt down with a basin, and he washed the feet of those who were serving him. And I'm like, wow, just super. That's just love. It's humility. Sacrificial love. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Yep. Yep. Amen. Amen. Yep. I want to move on to the to the last three. Uh, I was just reviewing, so for the sake of time, I'm going to go ahead and move on to number five. These are seven seven indications of love in your life. Um, number five is a little different, and I touched on this last week as we were closing, but we may not think about this, but you need to have a passionate love for the truth. In other words, if if you hear falsehood or lies, it ought to make you just stop dead in your tracks and go, that's a lie and I'm not going to tolerate it, and I'm going to stand up for the truth. Unfortunately, in, in, I've seen this happen in people's lives. You have a faithful Christian who served the Lord for years and years, and all of a sudden they, they sort of get trapped in a little sin, you know, and they start engaging in this sin, and they justify this sin, and they think, I can continue to be in the church or do something and, and dabble in this sin, and all of a sudden that sin begins to take over their life. And then after a while, they begin to compromise the truth. They twist or distort the truth because they think they're the exception. God has made an allowance for them. And, and after a while, they begin to stray from the truth and believe a lie. And they think that somehow they can justify their sin and eventually end up leaving the church. And so I, I asked last week, have you known someone who walked away from the truth and they believed a lie instead? 
And so I've witnessed this in, in some of the lives of my own friends um, who have left the church, people that I love and my heart aches for, but it happens. And so there must be a love for the truth. Uh, we cannot compromise the truth. We must love the truth. We must be passionate about it. And so uh, think of the highest form of love as agape. Uh, we need to include the truth in there as well. We love the truth. We're passionate about the truth. So how do we go about that? Um, the Bible says in Psalm 119, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We walk according to the truth. God's word illuminates our path. In John 8, 32, Jesus said, You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you believe a lie, you're in prison. You become a slave to falsehood. A love for the truth. Let's turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you have your Bible. I'll turn there real quick. 2 Thessalonians 2. I'll be reading verses 9 through 11. This talks about the advent of Satan and the lawless one. And I believe this is a reference probably to the latter days. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. Stop right there. What does that mean? A lot of people are going to be deceived. They get sucked into thinking that this is something of God and the truth is it's not at all. Verse 10. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. Now, why are they deceived? Why are they uh, being misled by wicked deception? It says, because they refuse to love what? What's your Bible say? The truth. They refused to love the truth. The Bible warns us that in the, in the latter days, there's going to be people who gather teachers to themselves who say what they want to hear that actually tickles their ears. Ooh, I like what you have. Ooh, that's a nice message. That sounds good. It makes me laugh. It makes me feel good about me. You know, sometimes we need to be broken in our spirit and weep after we hear a sermon from the Word. We need to repent and, and you know, sackcloth and ashes kind of attitude, not just feel good every time we hear a message. A feel-good speaker is a very dangerous speaker. Sometimes we need to all repent together. So the coming of the lawless one, we're told, uh, will come with Satan, with all his power, false signs and wonders. And um, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, verse 11, so that they may believe what is false. In order that all may be condemned um, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in un. Righteousness. Okay, quick question. So if, if we're going to have, according to number five, a love for the truth, how do we go about making sure we love the truth? Any thoughts? Yeah, we, so true. We have got to set aside time daily, preferably, to read and study the Word. Get involved in a reading program discipline yourself make that the first thing you do when you get up in the morning study the word set aside time every day to study the fact that you guys are here on a Wednesday night Bible study is a great sign where we can we can share and challenge each other and talk about the word get in a little deeper and talk about it so any other thoughts that was good thank you yes sir yes We may not necessarily want to hear the truth, and it may be painful for us, uh, but I think when we look into the Word and we discern what it tells us, then we reflect back into our own life, and we understand we need to change. Yes? Yeah, think about when uh, the prophet said, you, you are that man. You know, made, David was outraged when he heard the story, remember? about the rich man who stole the poor man's 
little ewe lamb that was like a just a child to him. He, he would sleep with it in his arms and cradle it. And the rich man stole the little sheep. David was outraged. You are that man, he said. Yes, sir. You had a comment? He is. He is. He had a penitent heart, didn't he? Yep. Mm-hmm. You lamb, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So often when somebody's critical of me, what I want to do is deflect back, you know, well, if you think that's bad, you ought to think about when you do this, you know, and I turn the tables. And so often I, what I need to say is, let me let me just think about that for a little while. I want to reflect on what you've said and and I think I'll probably find some truth in that, but you know, it's hard it's hard to accept the truth about ourselves when it's not always pleasant. Yeah. Being deflated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, somebody read 1 John 2, 21, if you've got your Bible open. 1 John 2, 21, and then drop down to verse uh, 24. 1 John 2, 21, again, the idea is a love of the truth and not being deceived by falsehood, false teachers. Uh, and, and you brought out such a great uh, point, and that is study the Word. We know that in the end there's going to be a test, right? We're going to be judged against what the Word says. We need, it's an open book test if we'll just study it and observe it and obey it. Sometimes it'll convict us, but it is the truth. Uh, who's got First John 2.21? Okay, John, thank you. Okay, so pursue it, passionately pursue it. Uh, did you read 24 as well? Yeah, drop down to 24. Yeah, see that it remains in you, what you have heard, the truth. Stick to it, follow it, and then you'll have the Son, you'll have the Father, you'll have, you'll have a godly life if you're passionate about the truth. And not compromise. It it just breaks my heart when I hear about religious groups, right? Modern religious groups who decide that the Bible is not inerrant. In other words, there's some things in it that cultures change, societies change, laws have changed, and so in order to be um, maybe more real in the minds of the world and attract people from the world. They've got to modify or change the truth a little bit to be more appealing. Wow, that's dangerous. To modify the Word of God just so we'll be more appealing to the world. I don't think so. Man, that's a dangerous practice. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I am the way, 
the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father except by me. No. Some people are offended at that. You mean Jesus is the only way? Is that what you're saying? I'm like, nope. That's what the Bible says. And God's word is inerrant. I believe it, and I must conform myself to it. Whether I like it or not, that's what saves me is the word. Yeah. Yeah. Who was the king that ended up throwing the, the scroll into the fire? I'm like, oh, you know, I don't like what it says. I'll just ignore it. We'll burn it. <laughs> There's a lot of scroll burning churches around now, you know. Really? I did not. Thomas Jefferson cut holes out in his Bible. I had a friend of mine. He's a minister. True story. He went to study with her, and they got on the subject of baptism. And she was very emphatic. She said, now, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible does not say that. And he said, well, turn over to such such a page. Sure enough, there was a scripture missing. She had cut that, page, that section of her page out. So her Bible did not say that because she had removed it. I'm like... What do, you, what do you do when you have a study with somebody and they say, well, my Bible doesn't say that? Get, yeah. May I suggest we start with a complete Bible? You know, wow. Mm -hmm. What I define it to be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sean. Yeah. That's right. That's a dangerous practice to start eliminating things you don't like. Add to or take away. Yeah, the plagues will be added to them. That's right. Um, hey, John, you still got your Bible handy? All right. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. This is, this is the, uh, our shepherds, our elders. This is one of the things that is required to serve as an elder in the church. And I, I just wanted to share this because we're on the subject of loving the truth. So Titus chapter 1 verse 9. Okay, so the subject is an elder and sound doctrine, now in the very first verse, what did it say he must do? He must hold firmly to sound doctrine. So we, we, the, the men that we choose to serve as our elders are men that are passionate about the truth. And toward the latter part of that verse, John, I think it talks about the ability to uh, confront those who are teaching error, right? Is that a role of an elder? So you have to know the word, you have to study the word, you have to be a, a very uh, skilled user of the word to be able to confront false doctrine. So I appreciate the role of our elders to protect us and shield us if they hear something that's not true, their antenna are like, bing, okay, we've got to deal with that because that's not biblical. That's their job. That's their responsibility. They love the truth. They're passionate about the truth. All right, I'm running out of time. Uh, very quickly, you might want to jot this down. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 4 is another reference to love of the truth. The next thing I want to read is 1 John 4. Uh, this is number 6, 1 John 4. And I'm going to read 16 through 19. But this love that we have, this, this agape love, if we practice it, we notice that there's an effect of it drawing us closer into God, a more intimate relationship. And, and this is really neat. It bolsters our own confidence of salvation. We feel confident of our salvation, not lacking confidence, but I love the Lord so much that I know he loves me Despite some of my imperfections, I know that he saved me by his grace. Uh, 
and and I and I feel joy. I feel confident. I, I feel thankful to be saved. And so that's really what the passage is saying in uh, 1 John 4. Listen, well, I'll just read it. 1 John 4, starting in verse 16. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides or lives in, walks in, dwells in love, abides in God. And God abides in him. Verse 17, by this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence. Is there any other translation that says a different word? Assur Boldness, assurance, confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected or completed in love. We love, why? Because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. So the idea is that if we understand the kind of love God wants us to have and we practice it, it makes us more confident that we are his children. Boy, that's it's kind of like, whoo, I'm at the top of the mountain. I'm, I'm practicing agape love, unconditional love. I'm loving the brethren, and I feel more confident in my walk with God. It's, it's really exciting if you think about it. If you practice the love God wants you to practice, it makes you more confident of your own salvation. Last word, uh, and this is number seven. How do you know real love when you see it? Well, once you appreciate the fact that you've got real love in your life and you're practicing it, then I was going to say, number seven is cherish and maintain it. Cherish and maintain it. Be on this constant maintenance exercise program where you don't lose that love you had. Make sense? Now, can this happen in our lives? Can we grow apathetic? Can we grow casual? Maybe take that love for granted, let other things distract us. Sure, it can happen. If you'll turn to Revelation chapter 2, you're going to see that there's a congregation that's warned, one of the churches in Asia Minor, that this happened, this very thing. Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. This is the church in Ephesus. Uh, we're told by the Lord, who's speaking to these various congregations, uh, he says to Ephesus in Revelation 2, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles, and they're not. You found them to be false. He goes on to say, by the way, this is sounding pretty good. I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. So, so far, so good, right? Until verse 4. He says, this one thing I have against you, Ephesus. I have this against you that you have abandoned the love that you had at first. Now, how does that happen to a church? How do they abandon that love? What do you think? Okay, maybe they start being mean-spirited toward each other, judging each other. Okay, I'm better than you. I have the right. Possibly. Yeah. What you said is correct, but I'm, I'm kind of in line with what Glenn is saying is that church is church and they're like, oh, I'm kind of getting tired of this worship thing and you know the sermon was sort of off today and you just didn't do anything for me and didn't meet my needs and all of a sudden it becomes commonplace routine blase you know worship <laughs> I've heard the message of Jesus on the cross so much I'm tired of it you know it grows it grows common it doesn't wow us anymore it doesn't move us to tears that's how you lose your first love May, well, I hate to bring it up, guys, but remember when you were dating? Whew, whoa, 
you go buy flowers, take her to a restaurant. You would sit across the table and look into her eyes. You would have a conversation. And you might even hold her hand and listen to what she said, right? 20 years later, you go to a restaurant. You know, you're both looking at your tablets or on the phone or you might say five words to each other or, you know, what do you think, dear? Or, what happened? What, why? Why are we not as engaged and interested and attentive to our wives 20 years later? We've lost that first love. Now, if you men are out there and you're just as affectionate and attentive and loving to your wife, way to go. Man, you are the man. But like most of us, right, sometimes we take those sweet wives for granted and, and we neglect them and, and they're just, I mean, it's, the spark may not be there anymore. We have to work at it, right? Am I right? Come on, guys. Don't leave me out here hanging. Gentry's not doing anything. He's poker face. All right. Am I right? So there's your example. You paid a lot of attention and you nurtured that relationship. You told her how much she meant to you. You told her you loved her. But then 20 years later, it's like, eh. You know, did you fold my socks, dear? Okay, well, maybe we need to ask her that. Okay. He, w he moved, did you see? He just went right on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's some on that, yeah. Yep. Amen. Yeah, I like the little bumper sticker on the back of some cars that says love wins. In the end, love conquers. It can overcome evil. It can overcome enemies. It is victorious if you love. Just wonderful. By the way, um, I was going to tell Dennis, I've been doing some study on the fires of coal. Remember we talked about that a couple of weeks back? So sometime in May, I'm going to do a let the Bible speak about what does that really mean? fires of coal so just thought I'd share that with you it's a, it's a neat study okay very quickly we're out of time um, number one the love that God wants us to have the highest form requires sacrifice it requires humility uh, number three it is a love mixed with grace and forgiveness number four it is an essential value first Corinthians 13 number five we must demonstrate a love for the truth. We talked about that tonight. Do not ever compromise a love for the truth. Number six, it's a love that draws us closer to the Father in a more intimate relationship and bolsters our confidence. And finally, number seven, we must cherish it and maintain it all through our Christian walk and never take it for granted. All right. Appreciate all your comments tonight and your thoughts. And I hope you've enjoyed this study. We'll wrap up next week with sort of a summary or review, try to apply some of these things. And we'll talk about the benefits of showing these characteristics or traits in our life. You doing a song?
All right, we appreciate y'all being here. We'll uh, go ahead and get started with our, our invitation. We've been talking about uh, tonight the highest form of love and why it's so important. And again, I just can't stress to you what better example of love is when Jesus laid down his life for us. He was the perfect sacrifice without sin, Hebrews tells us, tempted in every way yet without sin, yet he was willing to give his physical body on the cross, uh, submit to the will of God, and die for my sin. No greater love than this, he said, than a man lay down his life for his friends. So I want to challenge you to, to ask yourself, if I understand or truly comprehend how much God loves me, how do I show him in return? That I love him. What have you done lately to show God that you love him? Have you given up a certain sin? Have you prayed for somebody maybe that has been hard for you to pray for? Um, have, have you done an act of kindness or service in the name of Jesus secretly to someone? How have you told God lately that you love him? We know what Jesus did for us. My question is not, what have you done for him, where the invitation is just a time of reflection to think about your life, your heart, your ministry and work, and uh, we certainly will pray for you and help you in any way. Um, we're just a lot of sinners who work together to try to help each other get to heaven and appreciate the grace that's shown to us. So uh, let's stand and sing number 613, and uh, we'll be led in song. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the needs of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the spirit of life from above, into God's family divine, justified freely through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when at the sinner I came. Look at the offer or grace he did offer. He saved me, O oh, place his dear name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross thy Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Now I've a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there is this mansion sublime, and it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Riches eternal and blessings supernal from his precious hand I receive. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross my Savior made me whole. 
My sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. Some quick announcements. Um, our Lady Stone group is going to meet Friday at 1230 here in the Fellowship Hall. Our uh, brush up on friendship that was a ladies event scheduled April 17, uh, unfortunately, is going to have to be postponed. We're going to shoot for May 22. We, we really apologize for that. But Meg found out yesterday she's going to need to have outpatient surgery on Friday. So um, just remember her in your prayers and we hope that everything goes well. But um, we, uh, again, apologize for having to change that, but we're shooting for May 22, Saturday, for the ladies who are going to do Brush Up on Friendship. So should be a lot of fun. We hope that you can change that date to the 22nd. If you're graduating from high school or college, Joanne Shepard needs a picture and uh, a list of your future plans. We need that by May 12th. We'll include that in the bulletin. There is some uh, Lawwood Christian Camp. Uh, retreat dates, if you want to jot these down, middle and high school is going to be April 16, 18. Um, elementary school, April 23, 25. Uh, so those are the dates. And then there will be a flyer, more information on the, on the youth board. There's a bridal shower for, for Savannah, Savannah Garrett and Ethan Peterson on Sunday, May 2. So uh, if you'd like to help Savannah and Ethan celebrate, uh, that's going to be um, from 2 to 3.30 and they're registered at uh, Target at Walmart. That will be in the fellowship hall here at the building on May 2. Any family news or information that we need to share with anybody tonight? Anybody? Yes. The England man? Mike, okay. Make a note of that. He passed from COVID. I have not heard any updates on Freddie Garza. I heard he might be slightly better, uh, but it's a, it's a difficult recovery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I talked to Richard, I think, Sunday or Monday, one of those days. But uh, this is a tough battle, really difficult. My cousin is probably about the same. She's uh, s hopefully getting a little bit better. But once they get on a respirator, it's, it's a tough battle if you have COVID. So remember those two. And we ask that you remember Meg in prayer. I know you're going to be doing a prayer in just a minute, Roy. Yes. Okay, some, some tests. All right. And just for Roy's benefit, can you share his name? Greg. Greg. Right. Pray for Greg. Mm -hmm. Right. Greg will be having some tests, a bone scan, you said. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, Tom, how's he doing? A low grade cancer of the prostate. Yeah. Sounded like a medical person to me. See, you married up, Tom. That's a good thing. I hope. I hope you tell her you love her, because we talked about that in class. Hold her hand, look in her eye, you know. Anyway, if you have a godly wife, you should thank the Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. Okay, so Mike England passed from COVID. Uh, Greg is going to be having bone scans and some various tests done. We want to remember Meg. I'll write her down here, too. We just pray that everything will go well for her. It's outpatient surgery Friday morning early. And um, so, any other prayer requests? Yes, sir. So, uh, Lila was uh, actually announced for the new campus for free. Oh, new campers are free. Okay. So if anybody needs a ride, I'll be, uh, I'll be here on Friday. 
Great, great. So Noah will be here to give any of our new Lobwood campers uh, a ride. And he said, if this is your first retreat, it is free, right? Anything else? Good. I have a lot of good memories. True story, when my kids were young and they went to Lawood, they had so much fun. On their way one time, they were in the back seat talking about living there. You know, they were trying to figure out how they could live at Lawood all year long. So I thought that was sweet. All right, any other news, announcements? Okay, we'll be dismissed, Roy. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I've got your announcement here. This is from Darlene. It's, a, it's Jeff Trauber, and this is uh, Darlene's brother. We're requesting prayers for Jeff Trauber. Uh, he has chemo and radiation starting on Monday for six weeks. And she said part of that treatment is he has to lay very, very still uh, during that. I think it's like a 30-minute treatment. Is that correct? every day for 30 minutes. So she has an address, uh, cards can be sent. I'm gonna put this address up on the bulletin board in the back. Jeff Trauber, 1902 Hogan Drive, and that's Springfield, 37172. And I'll put that up in the for you if you wanna send her brother, Jeff Trauber, um, a card. All right, Roy. Let's pray. Our holy Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've given unto us. We thank you for the courage that you give us to face each other every day. We thank you for our, what you've given to us in the strength from within in our soul that we can know that you have us, you're behind us. Dear Lord, I ask that you be with Meg, or we ask that you be with Meg as she goes through these tests and prepare for the surgery. We ask, dear Lord, that you, you, be, you allow the surgeons to have a skillful hand and a ready knowledge and flight. But especially, dear Lord, we ask that uh, you uh, give the peace and quietness to Tom so that he can support her and stand with her and stand beside her. Uh, and dear Lord, we know, we, you know that, we know that they are a good couple and they strive hard for, to, prefer, to promote your word here at the church. And we ask their Lord through all of us, through our own heartfelt, that you be with them. We ask their Lord that you be with Greg as he goes through his test, through the bone scan. We ask that they find that everything is negative and that your, your healing hand can come up on him and bring him back into us. Be with his lovely wife so that she can give him the moral support that he needs. We ask, dear Lord, that you be with us so that we can be insightful and see and know what, what and what to say to Give them comfort and peace. Dear Lord, be with Tom Boatwright's dad with the prostate cancer. We ask that it would be able to be eradicated and that he can go back and have a, go back to the normal life of aggravating Tom. Uh, we ask, dear Lord, that as Tom stands forth and looks at him, that he can have the, the calmness and the stillness to face the dilemma and to give him hope and to let him know that he is loved by all of us and he is loved by you. We ask that you be with Darlene's brother, Jeff, as he goes through his chemo, chemo, and that you're able to that he's able to keep his spirits up and he's able to know that he's got a guiding hand with him as he goes through the process. And dear Lord, be with the family of Mike England who died recently from COVID. Give him the courage and strength to carry on and to 
remember the things that he'd done in his life that helped him to set off and bring blessings into their lives. Be with each and every one of us as we go out into the world, dear Lord. Allow us to shake this fear that people have of this disease or this pandemic that's going on. Give us the hope that man does not lose hope in you and not necessarily rely on the hope of what the government can provide for them. We ask, dear Lord, that we, as we go forth and we see the people on a daily basis, we can look into their eyes and see the hurt and walk them through and tell them that there is a light. Allow us that our light within us can shine to those around us, that we can bring forth the better and we can stand forth in the two commandments, to love the God, the Lord thy God, with all our heart, all the might, all thy soul, and all our mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Sometimes we forget, we forget to love our neighbors as ourselves because we gauge into the pettiness of what's going on in the world. We ask, dear Lord, that you help us to shake that and remember that we are an elite above the rest of the world. We are your children. And we, stand for, and we stand fast and we're supported through your graces and your love and your care. So as we go forth, Lord, allow us that we will serve you in the best way possible. This we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.